Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Can I remind everybody to ensure that you have all electronic devices switched off? Um, if you don't mind, please. Uh, item one on the agenda, can I welcome to the committee John Pentland, who's joined us. He's a new member uh, who's uh, here in place of Siobhan McMahon. Can I just place on uh, the record my appreciation and thanks for the work that Siobhan has done uh, as a member of the committee? Um, she was a member of the committee from the start of the year, so hasn't been with us that long, but um, it, it was good to have Siobhan as a member of the committee uh, during 2015. But can I welcome John formally to the committee this morning, and can I invite John to declare any relevant registrable interests? I convene I have no relevant interest to declare. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, our next item is for us to decide whether to take item 7, in, uh, which is to consider our work programme in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Item three this morning, as Siobhan McMahon has left the committee, we will now have to elect a new deputy convener. The Parliament has agreed that members of the Scottish Labour Party are eligible to be chosen as deputy convener. This being the case, can I invite nominations for the position of deputy convener? Can I move uh, Mark Griffin? Mark Griffin. Second. Okay, can I, thank you very much. Um, there are no other nominations, so therefore, um, are we agreed that Mark... Griffin is appointed as the Deputy Convener of the Education and Culture Committee. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can I thank all of you and thank, of course, Mark, uh, Mark for agreeing to become our new Deputy Convener and welcome him to his post. Uh, item four uh, on the agenda uh, is uh, uh, to appoint a new European Union reporter following Siobhan McMahon's resignation from the committee. Can I invite nominations for that post? Any, Mark's been uh, nominated for that. Any other nominations? Okay, can I take it that it's agreed that Mark Griffin becomes our European Union reporter? Uh, that's also agreed. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, congratulations, uh, Mark, on your two uh, new posts. Uh, can I now turn to the uh, first substantive item on our agenda? This morning we will begin our work on examining the spending decisions made and the outcomes uh, delivered by some of the key public bodies within our remit. Uh, today's evidence session will be uh, focused on Creative Scotland. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Janet Archer and Ian Munro. Uh, good morning to you both, uh, both from Creative Scotland. Um, and I believe, Janet, are you going to give us some opening remarks? I do. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Good morning, convener and members of the committee. Um, I want to start by thanking the committee for inviting us to give evidence this morning. This is an extremely dynamic time for the arts, screen and creative industries in Scotland. The Edinburgh festivals have once again announced an increase in audiences and participants. And last year, the Commonwealth Games cultural programme reached thousands of people stretching from Orkney to Glasgow. There are many people in many places across Scotland contributing significantly to the arts, screen and creative industries all of whom will welcome the fact that culture and creativity is being discussed at the heart of government today. Our submission ahead of this session hopefully provides the committee with the detail and information that you need to make positive and constructive recommendations as a result of this inquiry. However, I'd like to highlight some key points, if I may. As you know, Creative Scotland was formed as the merger of the Scottish Arts Council and Scottish Screen in 2010 as part of the government's commitment to public sector reform. In addition, we were given a role in supporting the growth of the creative industry Industries. And following a challenging few uh, early years, the organisation took stock in December 2012 and the board made a series of commitments to change. I joined as chief executive in July 2013 and with, the, with the task of delivering on these commitments. And key to this was the development of our 10-year plan which we published in April 2014, which in itself was developed through consultation with a reference group and more than 1,000 people working across the arts, screen and creative industries. It's a shared plan. And it's interesting to note the publication of a widely discussed report earlier this year from the Warwick Commission, which talks about cultural value, and it talks about the the lack of attention that's been paid to the synergies between the interlocking sectors of the cultural and creative industries, uh, mainly in England. Um, it talks about an ecosystem. We talked deeply about this in Scotland last year uh, when we were discussing our 10-year plan, and we worked up what we call the creative system in our plan. So in Scotland, we're paying full attention to these connections and working hard to develop an intelligent understanding of them. 
to strengthen everybody's ability to be able to deliver whatever they do. And an important part of this plan was the simplification of our funding systems. So we now have three routes to funding, regular funding, open project funding, and targeted funding. And this enables us to carefully allocate our 88.85 million and annual budget, which comprises both grants in aid and national lottery funding. And I think it's really important for the committee to note that across our three routes to funding, we receive more than 4,000 applications for funding each year, of which we are able to support about a third. And thankfully, we're able to fund some amazing individuals and projects and organisations, but we also have to turn away more than we would like to support, given, given if we had more resources. And this was thrown into relief last year when we launched our regular funding programme, which was aimed at providing funding for up to three years for organisations. And we set a budget of £100 million for a three-year period, um, subject to amendments if overall budgets change. And we received 20, 212 applications, which uh, allocated which in total amounted to almost £250 million worth of applications. And the resulting portfolio, rich as it is, is made up of, of 118 organisations, which range from the world-renowned, such as the Edinburgh International Festival and Centre for the Moving Image, to the locally significant, like Anne Lanterre and Stornoway, the culturally vital, such as the Gallic Arts Body for Vation Gale, and the emerging, such as the Stove in Dumfries. Inevitably, however, funding decisions create tensions, and as you've seen in some of the submissions that you have received as part of this inquiry. However, in the majority of cases, our relationship with the high volume of applicants we engage with, both successful and unsuccessful, is a constructive, open and professional one. There's lots of independently gathered evidence for this, some of which has been presented in our submission. However, one figure that sums this up for me is the percentage of our stakeholders who feel favourably towards Greater Scotland, a figure which has increased from 67% in, 20, in November 2012 to 91% in March of this year. It's recognised that we've listened and responded to the criticism levied at the organisation three years ago. Of course, there are always things that we can improve on, and everyone at Creative Scotland is committed to continuing to work as hard as we can to do this, to check, to listen and respond. And one of the key leadership messages that I have given to my team is to see the organisation as a learning organisation which continues to adapt and respond to deliver the best possible results in everything that we do, even if that means saying no which is always really hard, and especially when we're saying no to Scottish talent and creative potential. So I'd like to finish with just a couple more statistics, statistics which I think are relevant. Firstly, we know that the Scottish Household Survey, that cultural engagement in Scotland is increasing up to 91% in 2013. So more people in Scotland value and take part in cultural activities. And secondly, we know that internationally, Scotland's positive reputation is increasing up to its high, highest level ever according to the nation's brands index. And culture has played a hu huge role in that reputation and, that and the ambition and the talent of energy and every of everyone working in our arts and creative sectors is pivotal to Scotland's continuing confidence and success. So Ian and I are both looking forward to this morning's conversation. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Janet. Um, before I come to uh, other members, I, I just wanted to start... Um, by taking you back to the, the merger itself. Um, and uh, one of the consequences of the merger was a reduction in the overall number of staff um, that uh, the, or the new merged organisation had in comparison to the two previous organisations. And I just wondered whether or not um, you feel that you now have the necessary expertise and capacity to support the creative sector as Creative Scotland that was in place when the two previous organisations existed. Yes, so we had 150 staff uh, prior to merger and we reduced that by about a third. So uh, we're now operating with around 100 staff and we've got a number of, of fixed term posts which takes us up to 110. Uh, I, in joining the organisation, um, uh, I, I was very impressed and very pleased with the depth of expertise that my team holds. So we've organised ourselves around arts, screen, creative industries. We've got a director of arts and engagement director of, of screen uh, and director of creative industries, all of whom have come from very respected and recognised uh, 
long histories of working in the field. Uh, we've got a team of team leads for individual specialists across the art forms, dance, theatre, music, visual arts, literature and publishing uh, and in the screen team uh, and in creative industries. Um, I'm confident that as an organisation we hold expertise. We are all pushed uh, for time and, and clearly as, as we become more well known and we generate increased numbers of applications from across uh, the work that we serve, there is always pressure in terms of the administrative capacity that the organisation has in delivering funding. We think we do that well now, we think we're efficient and certainly the feedback that we're getting from, from uh, people out there is that we are operating in an effective way. I'm just, could you maybe give some detail about where the, the 50 were reduced from? You know, which areas of the business effectively lost staff? Um, if you're saying that uh, you have the necessary expertise and capacity to support the creative sector with 100, 110 staff that you currently have, um, in which areas were there cuts? And can you also maybe expand on that a little bit? I mean, obviously all organisations, particularly public bodies, have a lot of other duties they have to perform. They, you know, they have to meet with regards to the qualities duties and lots of other work that they must do, which is not necessarily part of their, if you like, frontline operation, which is, you know, in your case, supporting the creative sector in Scotland. Um, I'm just wondering whether, is the, do you feel the core purpose of the organisation is any way affected by the losses that have occurred um, in staff? Uh, and how, what's the, what's the kind of, What's the balance between the, the amount of work that's done doing other things and supporting the organisation and meeting all your public sector uh, duties and your frontline core activities? Okay, I'm, I'm going to say a few words, if I may, and then I'll pass on to Ian Munro, uh, who holds the, the, the corporate history of the organisation. Um, I think, from my perspective, when organisations, when funding organisations reduce their staff, the the first thing that goes is the development role of the organisation. So it's all of those careful conversations, uh, advice giving, um, working to ensure that the knowledge that the organisation holds is properly shared and, and disseminated out into the field in order to support the things that people do. We simply don't have time to do as much of that as, as perhaps we might if we had more people. Um, Ian, I don't know whether you want to add to that. So the, uh, it's worth recognising that the uh, financial memorandum that accompanied the Public Sector Reform Bill um, set a head count um, for Creative Scotland at the point of creation. Um, <clears throat> and that's what led to, um, to the, the uh, number that we're sitting at at the moment. Um, the process that, that um, surrounded that um, journey from uh, 150 down to 100, 110, um, principally took the form of four rounds of voluntary severance. So actually it was through a process of um, uh, self-volunteering by staff and therefore you, there was no, not necessarily control um, where, where uh, everyone uh, who was requesting voluntary severance um, to be accepted. But in the end, um, uh, the majority, if not all staff who, who did, um, were accepted on that basis and therefore expertise left the organisation in certain quarters. However, since then, because the, the process of recruitment, um, where there have been further opportunities for um, staff uh, to come into the organisation, we've been very careful to understand what the needs are looking forward um, uh, as an organisation to therefore begin to target where we were able to attract um, the right skills and expertise into the organisation. I think the balance is, is reasonable overall. I think there, there are certain areas where we, we will want to keep a very close eye in terms of um, how we can, we can move forward. But um, the, uh, the, the balance for us about ensuring that we have the maximum resources available to the front line, and that's in terms of skills and expertise and finances, against the administration overhead that we, we have, that which we are keen to ensure we continue to manage very, very tightly. We are very uh, clear that we need to keep that balance in, in very close uh, scrutiny. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kavira. Um, Cape Scotland have um, developed a number of strategies, um, sector reviews, and you mentioned yourself the 10-year the plan. Just to ask how actions proceeding, um, what progress you're making against those various um, strategies, reviews and plans, when do you expect to start seeing 
and reporting on the results of those? So we're, we're, uh, we produced this 10-year plan uh, last April, and we said we would produce uh, an art strategy, a screen strategy, and a creative industry strategy. We've actually done that in, 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 in um, we've gone, taken the screen strategy first, that's published, it's now a year old and we're currently scrutinising the impact of that uh, and we'll produce a report very shortly. The creative industry strategy is about to be published in draft form uh, and that has taken a bit longer partly because we, uh, we appointed our permanent director of creative industries last this June. Um, so he's been in post for a matter of months. He's already produced the strategy and it's been discussed with our other public sector partners uh, and we're almost at a point now where that will go out for public consultation um, and then we'll start um, reviewing how we're performing against it. Um, and the arts and engagement strategy is going to be published once we've completed the suite of sector reviews which the organisation committed to um, three years ago. Uh, so we're just finishing the visual arts sector review. We've just published the literature and publishing sector review. And once that's in tray, we'll produce the art strategy. We have a series of performance measures which are articulated in our annual plan. So underneath the 10-year plan, we produce an annual plan on, an, on a 12-month basis. And in that, we set ourselves a, a, a set of performance measures which we uh, are reporting against. Our first report, which will be set against our benchmark first year, will be published this autumn. Yes. Okay, thanks for that. You mentioned as well in the research that you carried out about um, perception and relationships and trust with the, the sector um, after the merger. And you, you mentioned a jump in satisfaction from 6 to 91%. Just to ask whether you think there are any specific areas um, where work still needs to be done to to, to build trust and, and rebuild relationships? I think it's an ongoing piece of work, to be honest. I think an organisation like us should never, ever get complacent. And it's our job to listen hard to the feedback that we get from all quarters and respond to it as and when it comes in. The, 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 the challenge that we face as an organisation is that we have to say no to some applicants, sometimes very painfully, even when they're very strong applications, because we simply don't have the resource or budget, like any other public sector body, to, to deliver to everyone. So we have to make judgments, we have to make decisions. What's really important to me is that we explain those decisions really clearly and the rationale behind them. So when we had our regular funding round just before Christmas, my team made a proactive decision to meet every single applicant that wanted to meet who hadn't been successful and we spent probably about six weeks of our time meeting people who were genuinely quite distressed and some of those meetings were very difficult and when we we didn't resolve or or where we weren't able to explain in that first meeting we went back and had another meeting until we got to a position where things settled and things were clear and then we started to encourage people to think about other routes of funding both within creative scotland but also making sure that people knew what the opportunities were outside of creative scotland in order to be able to apply funding for funding for the things that they wanted to do uh, and i don't think that job of work ever stops uh, i think that's an ongoing um, process for us. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the the uh, bread and butter of our organisation, if I can call it that, is um, built on discussion and uh, discourse and debate. So it's really important that we organise ourselves in a way which ensures that we've got easy um, connections into and through the organisation and staff that are genuinely engaged on an ongoing basis uh, throughout the year. Um, and we, what we've been doing over the last couple of years is to really reorganise ourselves in a way that enables that to happen most effectively. Uh, it continues to be a work in progress and I think it's really important that we are seen and have a presence um, throughout the geography of Scotland on a, on a regular basis. Um, whilst acknowledging that um, we have limitations in, in capacity. But it's really important that we are connected in, in that way through the, the staff and the expertise that they hold. And if I might add just one more point. The, the, 
we've organised ourselves around four areas of, of, of work. So funding is one, advocacy and championing the work of the sectors that we serve is another development, which is really about working in partnership with others to draw in and create the conditions for funding to be provided um, from other places as well as us is one, and influencing so that we can use all of the knowledge that we hold, make it publicly available as a, as a, as a public body for anyone to use to inform and, and, and the, the work that they want to do across arts and culture and creative industries in, in, in Scotland. Okay, thank you. You mentioned um, the uh, sector's view of the organisation improving from a satisfaction rate of 67, I think it was, percent, you said, up to 91%. Um, what do you think is responsible for that? certainly a very impressive change. I think partly it's to do with the language that we speak. I think it's really important that we um, communicate with people on their terms, that we don't try and superimpose uh, a, 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 a dialect and a, a language that doesn't work. And of course, across our remit, we have very different constituencies. So we have the, the art sector, artists and arts organisations, uh, but we also have the commercial creative end of the spectrum. So as an organisation, we need to be dexterous and, be able, and, and multilingual. I think one of the things that came through from our reference group in developing the plan was Creative Scotland needs to be multilingual. It needs to speak different languages depending on which constituency that it's talking to. Uh, and I think we're starting to become more adept at being able to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary? I, I listened carefully uh, to your contribution. Extremely dynamic time. You're full of discussion and discourse, working in partnership and communicating on these terms. You've given us a good pitch here today uh, and I have to say as an MSP for the Highlands and Islands I think the remaining 9% would probably belong to Uncommon Gaelic and traditional music and song. So if I can just uh, read out very briefly uh, convener what they say Uncommon Gaelic I don't see anything that leads me to believe that changes have helped us engage with Creative Scotland. Our community is excluded uh, as a non-beneficiary <coughs> of Creative Scotland, <laughs> it's impossible to speak about tangible benefits. Creative Scotland, I'm shocked at this one, provides no support whatsoever for the national mod, and sadly, from our point of view, they fail the Gaelic community. Now, I think taking a few lessons in Gaelic is not exactly going to bridge this gap. Why has this happened? Why do you fail this community why is there such a gap in empathy, understanding and support for the Gaelic community from Creative Scotland? Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we do fund in respect of Gaelic, uh, which is the language that we're very interested in and we're very interested in Gaelic culture uh, and everything that it has to offer. So organisations that have a substantial focus on Gaelic received 6.4% of the overall regular funding budget uh, in, when, when we made decisions last year. Um, so that's a number of organisations. Um, so that's Anne Lanter, Atlas Arts, Face Roche, Face Nagail, De Kershava, the Gaelic Books Council, the National Piping Centre and Tracks. Can I ask you to respond to the question I asked you rather than giving me another pitch? And, and uh, in, in respect of the mod, we are interested in the mod. It's a highly, su hope so. highly successful hope so. uh, and, 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 and very strong part of Gaelic culture. It's unfortunate that an application was put it, submitted for open project funding. It wasn't successful. As I understand it, I had an email this morning from our Gaelic officer. Dialogue is already taking place in respect of how that application could be strengthened in respect of the 2016 mod for, for next year. Uh, so we are in close dialogue. I think it's also important to say that our funding has to be used in, in places where funding is genuinely needed. And in some instances, if something is incredibly successful without funding, and when we get an application in a, in, in, in a panel where something has no, uh, isn't successful without funding, then we have to make a, a, a judgment based on, on 
intervening where funding is, is, is absolutely necessary in order for something to happen. Well, I understand that, but you still haven't... Perhaps the witnesses may agree to give this uh, in writing, but I really want to know, as an MSP from the Highlands and Islands, why this organisation, which is totally respected in the Gaelic community, why they feel that they've been so badly let down by Creative Scotland. If there's not time for you to address that today, convener, or I give you one more chance to do that, I have one other question I want to ask. What are you, why are they so marginalised? Why do they feel so excluded? Why do they feel so let down from Creative Scotland? I think it's because they haven't been funded so by it's their Creative fault. Scotland. From what I understand, we've had a, a number of, of discussions and dialogues with with, with, with the organisation this year and we will continue to have dialogue and discussion if I'm, I've, I've a long track record of meeting with organisations personally myself in, in many instances I haven't met with this organisation directly myself but I'm very happy to do that uh, if there are still issues that haven't been resolved by my team in, in dialogue with them Okay, my second question is the traditional music uh, and song. And any of us uh, with uh, grey hairs that I've got and lived in Scotland all my life only has to look along the patrons, Ali Bain, Phil Cunningham, Barbara Dixon, Archie Fisher and Sheena Wellington, known to anyone who's lived all their life in Scotland. And I found it very sad uh, to, to hear that they're constantly having to make the case for traditional arts and music to be considered equally amongst other art forms. Uh, now, I'd like you to address that. And the second point, which uh, it's on page two of their submission, third paragraph, they're looking for £5,000. And the project was about supporting young musicians to develop their career, career as well as bringing their music to diverse communities around Scotland. £5,000. Now, they tell us that your rule uh, is to have only one live application for any project at a time, but they've been excluded. You know, they're not asking for much, but the funding they get can transform young lives and keep our Scottish culture of traditional music alive. So why are they having so many difficulties with you? Um, I can't comment on that particular application, but I will go back I've seen their, their submission. I yep. presume you've read their submission. Yeah, I have. Um, what I can say is that traditional music and, and song and storytelling is incredibly important to me. I, my background is dance. My first form of dancing was Highland dancing because my father was, was very keen that I connect with my Scottish heritage. So uh, I fully understand the importance of traditional art forms in, in Scotland. Um, uh, open project funding is competitive. We fund about 30% of the applications that we get, and we always have to say no to good, strong applications that come into us because of the resources that we've got available to spend in respect of that project funding. What we always do is talk to applicants when they want to talk to us to help them to strengthen their applications to be more competitive the next time that they come in. Um, we're also in the process of reviewing the way that we, we uh, deliver open project funding. We've had a number of comments from a range of organisations in respect of the issue around only being able to have one application in uh, at a time. So we're looking at that and we're about to announce uh, a refreshing of the, the, the guidelines for open project funding. Ian, I don't know whether you want to add anything so to that. So tradi is Scottish traditional music and song, is that treated equally it is. to all? Well, they don't feel yeah. that. So I think historically, Creative Scotland had budgets which were ring-fenced around art forms and different areas of work. We, I, when I joined the organisation, I got rid of all of that. So now we have one open project fund and everybody who applies to it is treated in the same way, no matter what their specialism is. So there's, there's the opportunity for traditional music and song to increase its funding based on the strength of its application in every way, as equal way as everybody else who applies. Um, I think we're still 
um, we still need to work harder on communicating the changes in the way that we're funding um, and the way that we've, 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 we've addressed some of those historical issues. Uh, and I take your point uh, in, in, in respect of the need to I think a few trips up to E9 to Inverness would not be unhelpful. We will do that. And, and indeed, I have, I have visited uh, Inverness on, on, on a number of occasions uh, and enjoy it very much. Yeah. Sorry, can I just add that it's worth recognising that we also convene... Uh, uh, this is not an internal group, it's an external group, a traditional arts um, group, which is including all of those who are working in traditional arts, from music and dance and song and, and storytelling across Scotland. Um, we convene that group. Um, TMSA are a very strong and passionate advocate for the work that they do within the, uh, the scope of that, that bigger and broader group. So, um, so I think it's uh, an important role that they undertake. I would echo Janet's point, though, that absolutely traditional arts are uh, respected and valued and um, are welcome within the Open Project funding. But that, that example that you've given, Yes, it's a small amount of money, but it does absolutely illustrate um, the very tough choices that we have to make um, in terms of the volume of applications against the available funding resource that we have. Thank you very much. Ian, um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. I'd, I'd like to ask just a few questions around about performance measurement and uh, value for money, and perhaps starting with a very basic <laughs> question. Is there a, any inherent difficulty in defining and measuring the qualitative outcomes given the remit of uh, Creative Scotland, and how do you approach that? So we're, ju we're just in the process now of looking at how we assess quality, which is always a challenge for, for any, any public funder. Uh, so we've... Um, We've just got to conclusion. We've been working with a reference group uh, of external experts to pull together an approach to create um, what we're broadly calling an artistic and creative assessment framework. Uh, that will do what, what that will do is it will build up a, a bank of, of expertise from. Um, Three areas, I suppose, from 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 staff um, in respect of properly recording and accounting for staff um, judgment in relation to artistic and creative expertise across the work that we fund. Uh, we'll be working with a, a group of peers uh, to produce peer reports, um, which will be part of that suite of tools that we'll use to, to affect judgments. Uh, we'll also take into account um, what sits in the wider public domain in relation to critical um, feedback, uh, but also public feedback, um, which is now readily available to all of us in, 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 in terms of social media. So all of that will feed into the judgments that we make in respect of artistic and creative expertise. We're about to pilot that work. Um, so very soon we'll be announcing uh, a pilot program with a small number of organisations because we need to take this very carefully um, and once that's concluded um, and providing we have the resources available to be able to deliver it, we'll then roll that out more, more widely. Do you think your current uh, means of uh, measuring and uh, anal analysing quality is adequate? I do. I think we have a, a, a. I can confidently say that we have experts who are respected both in Scotland, but as importantly respected outside of Scotland in terms of the expertise that they hold. Um, and when we judge artistic and creative quality in an application, we take their views into account. Um, but we also pull in other views across the organisation to, to be able to ensure that we've, we've, we've carried out a thoroughly robust process in terms of, 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 of um, deciding whether something is, is strong or has the potential to be strong, uh, which is important to us as well. Much of what you're talking about is very internalised, internal analysis. Surely the final uh, judgment is by the public. How do you measure that? We talk to the sector, um, so the, the, the artistic and creative communities um, that are part of the, 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 our, our remit uh, are people that we have ongoing daily dialogue with, uh, and we listen hard in respect of views that people hold. In respect of the public, we have a very strong social media presence um, with, with a, a large number of Twitter followers, many of whom will comment on a, on a daily basis in respect of work that they have seen. So through that, we build up a, a bank of expertise in terms of public view. I still get a very strong impression that this is 
quite an internal process in terms of judgment. But let me move on to something else. The comments have been made that uh, Creative Scotland focuses a great deal on niche and specialist output as opposed to material which is uh, attractive to wider audiences. How would you comment on that? I think the audience figures that have come through most recently in respect of the increase in audiences for the Edinburgh festivals signals that much of the work that we support is playing out to wide reach. Um, and that is incrementally increasing year on year. I, we will be in a position this autumn to have substantive data in place because we've systemised that, which will give us a sense of how well Scotland is doing compared to other nations in terms of its audiences for arts and, and creative events. My um, instinct in coming into Scotland two years ago is that audiences are good and strong in Scotland, not only in, in the central belt, but beyond. So uh, I read with interest to see that Tam Dean Byrne, when he rode his bicycle last year from Orkney uh, through Scotland down to Glasgow, was attracting, um, I think he had about 900 people who, who went to hear his stories on Orkney, um, which was, was, was very positive to hear. Um, what we need to do is, is absolutely generate tangible data to be able to make sure that we can tell that story in an evidence-based way. Uh, and we've now systemised the process of doing that, and we'll be able to do that from the end of this year. So how, how do you balance this question of supporting more niche performances and so on versus the need to cater for the, for the larger population? I would question whether or not across the piece, everything that we do is only supporting niche audiences. In, in Venice, um, the um, Eden Court uh, Theatre is one of the most successful theatres outside of London. It only does that through playing out to a wide audience that, that comes in from, from a wide circumference around the venue and the, the, the product that it, it, it it produces and, and, and presents is very much geared towards a broader audience and Inverness is one of our core regularly funded organisations. Perhaps looking at uh, another aspect of Creative Scotland, Creative Scotland's got responsibility for allocating funding but it's also got a responsibility for providing sort of de developmental and advocacy support for the creative se sectors. Is that a conflict, conflict of interest there would you say? No, uh, I would say they're absolutely intertwined. So in order to be a good funder, we have to have a good, strong sense of what the developmental needs of each of the sectors that we serve are. And we have to make sure that we fund in a way that makes sense, that's strategic, that actually delivers um, proper um, resources and support for Scotland to be able to unlock its creative potential in, in as wide a way as, as, as is possible. Perhaps just a final quick question on the film, your film strategy. There's been criticism, I think, that uh, Creative Scotland has no clear objectives in respect to film strategy. How would you comment on that? I would point you to our screen strategy, our film strategy, which is now up online. It's been, it's been in, in published for a year. <coughs> it has five clear objectives around film education, talent and skills development, film development and production, inward investment and co-production and exhibition and audiences. Uh, we're very clear in respect of what we're doing. We're already starting to see rewards come from that. Film production in Scotland is now over 40 million, I think, in the last year. That's a significant increase from previous years. So we're starting to see a real impact. We have had a number of conversations with a number of producers who want to bring productions to Scotland. I was really pleased to see the, the, the Train Spotting 2 uh, has just been announced. Uh, so so, so uh, Andrew McDonald, Danny Boyle is, 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 is now committed to that with, I think, most of the original cast. Uh, we saw in the press, uh, uh, I think a day or two ago, uh, that um, Chris Young is now developing, a, uh, we're back to Inverness, a new television series which will be set in Inverness. Um, and there are a number, we've seen Sunset Song, which is Bob Last's production, which has just premiered at the Toronto Film Festival, which has done incredibly well. Um, and I could talk for quite a while, but uh, probably that's not <laughs> appropriate. Okay, thank you. Um, check, supplementary. Yes. Good morning, and nice to see you again. Um. From the Economy Committee, just on that last question, 
Um, you know that after the, the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee had our session with you, uh, that there was a lot of um, angst about the lack of a film strategy and about the, the, the fact that we'd slipped from second in the UK in terms of film production to fifth. Let me ask you, if I may, two questions. One is, do you believe we are going to have a film studio in three years' time? And the second one is the CMI, the Centre for Moving Images, criticised the lack of clear objectives in relation to a CS's film strategy. And in fact, it said that while CS plans to translate the strategy into a work plan, there were no KPIs, no measurable, measurable objectives. Now, you know, we wish you well, but uh, in terms of measuring performance, with such a critical item that uh, was broadcast, not just in Scotland, um, why don't we have a meaningful, measurable strategy or objectives in that strategy? And I'd like your confirmation that we will have the film studio in three years. We do have meaningful, measurable um, outcomes, which are... So why does CMI say you don't? We, the, the strategy is, has been translated into work plan. We use that internally. Uh, we're very happy to share that. And what we'll be doing is uh, producing a report um, after year one of the film strategy being in existence, and we will make that public. So that, that will come into play, uh, and already the impact of that strategy is tangible, and we can evidence uh, success against uh, the work that's been taking place through that strategy. Um, we recently um, announced a new... We've, we've announced a, a skills fund uh, and just delivered that uh, and made decisions in respect of the partners that will be delivering that uh, fund with us. Uh, so that was a million pounds. Uh, it was announced a week or so ago. Uh, and we've just also uh, been pleased to work with our partners at the Scottish Government to produce a new £1.75 million pound production growth fund uh, and what that will do is unlock opportunity for more production to take place in Scotland. So incrementally we are beginning to track real genuine success in respect of film and as I say it's certainly increasing the appetite of producers not just in Scotland but from beyond Scotland to want to come and work here in, 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 in this nation. And in respect of the film studio the film studio is a, a commercial proposition. Uh, it has to be a commercial proposition yes, because... Yes, but it has a bearing on, on your costs going forward. There must be some, some element of it that attaches, not, maybe not the capital spent, but there must be some element that goes forward as part of your, what is it, 10-year plan. Yes, and we, we have a, 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 a film production fund, uh, 4 million, which we, we've, uh, and we've now increased that by 1.75 million, uh, and that is attached to production both linked to a film studio, but also also beyond. We've seen we do have a film studio in Scotland. In fact, we do we we yeah. we've seen Outlander and the production that it's been able to generate 20 million, I think, in the last year, uh, incredibly successful. Uh, and there's the opportunity to to build on that. There are also production facilities in other parts of Scotland on Sky um, and 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 Stornoway and so on. Uh, so there are a number of pop-up spaces which actually provide quite a significant amount of space for 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 film production companies to use. Where yeah, but forgive me, we were talking at the time about how we move Scotland from fifth, you know, hopefully back up to second. Yeah, I prefer first, but up to second. Uh, and these pop-up uh, film studios were there then. We were talking about the progressive future for film, the film industry in Scotland. So I'm as, I think you know, I'm as, 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 as driven and passionate about the need to develop a film studio in Scotland as, 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 as you are. Uh, in fact, at this very moment, there's a meeting taking place um, with Scottish government colleagues and Scottish Enterprise to discuss the film studio. Uh, and if I wasn't here, or if Ian and I weren't here, we'd be there um, keeping the momentum going in terms of that conversation. Um, so I, I, I think we're all aware there's a commercial proposition on the table. It looks very exciting. I think all of the players involved are feeling increasingly confident in respect of the film studio coming into realisation. Um, and we just have to wait until the, the, the processes that need to be gone through are delivered uh, before that 
can be, be, be made public. So I think the answer is a possible maybe. <laughs> I'm smiling. A hopeful possible maybe. <laughs> But I think what, what I would say is it's, it, 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 Creative Scotland would say it's absolutely fundamental, really important. It's right there as a top line in our screen strategy. It has been um, signed up to by our board as a, as, as a priority and we're doing everything within our power to encourage uh, and foster an environment where that is a, becomes, a, becomes a reality. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam, did you have a supplementary on this? Yeah, it was back more to uh, the line of question that Colin had initially. Well, back to right, okay. uh, Gordon, you had a question, I think, that probably fits in here. Yeah, um, it's basically along the lines of, you mentioned the production growth fund, the £1.75 million. Pounds. My understanding is that's a, an incentive to try and encourage more film and TV productions to come to Scotland and be based in Scotland. Uh, I also serve in the Economy, Energy and uh, sorry, tourism. <laughs> tourism committee, and and, and we did we did the <laughs> I'm sure I and we did a report as you're aware into creative industries, and there was a concern about lift and shift, where um, we had TV production companies that would uh, come up to Scotland, bring their own crew, their own technicians, their own actors, producers, directors, writers, um, be here for a few weeks, film it, and, and shoot off back down south again. Um, it, you know, the guidance, my understanding, is being written for this production growth fund, but is there going to be anything within that guidance that is going to address that issue so that independent television <coughs> production companies that are based in Scotland will get a share of this production growth fund? Absolutely. And Ian can talk in a bit more detail about that. Yeah. I think uh, it's... Its title is important. It's called a production growth fund as opposed to an inward investment fund for that very reason. I think it's there to signal the fact that what we want to see is uh, an opportunity for growth in Scotland, be that from indigenous um, talent, skills and production uh, uh, on its own or in playing alongside um, from those overseas. So I think it's really important and that this will be uh, a clear point within the Production Growth Fund guidance when it is uh, made available and public and open for business um, later in October. Yeah, okay. And um, I would be with you in saying everything, everything we do has to be about n both nurturing and growing talent here, but also keeping talent here. Mm. It's fundamentally important. It distresses me when people uh, take up opportunities elsewhere because they can't deliver things in, in Scotland and, and, and we have to focus everything that we do on, on that. Right, okay, thanks very much for clearing that up. I've got one more question about regular funding. Uh, can I ask it now? Or do you want Come back to you. I'm going to bring in Liam now. Okay. Don't mind it. Liam. Okay. Uh, it's just going back to the point about measurables and um, the, the outcome of the Scottish Household um, Survey. I think from the previous discussions we had, maybe shortly after um, you took up post, there was a discussion around whether or not um, Creative Scotland was um, better at broadening and deepening the engagement it had with people that already had some element of engagement with the arts in, in whatever form, rather than actually spreading, spreading it out to those um, who, who didn't have that engagement, either for socioeconomic reasons or, or extreme rurality or whatever it may, may be. Can you point to anything in terms of, of what's come back through the evidence, whether through the, the, the household survey, whether through the work you do with Ipsos Mori, Mori or whatever, that suggests that you're, you're managing to crack that, um, that question of, of, of engaging with those that previously haven't had engagement? And if you are doing that, is there much you can do by way of deepening and broadening that engagement rather than it simply being a, a tick box exercise, we've reached them, we'll, 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 we'll move on and get back to those that it's easier to, to engage with. Yes, it's, it's, it's very important to me that we reach out beyond those people who would, as a matter of course, have access to arts and culture into people and communities who wouldn't ordinarily have access for whatever sort of reason. So we have fed equalities, uh, diversity and inclusion as a core connecting theme across everything that we do in our plan. So um, we, we published a, a mainstreaming report and which begins to outline how we might do that uh, and this year we're carrying out an equalities, diversity and inclusion review uh, 
which is, is I, for me, one of the most important pieces of work that we're, going, we're, going, we're doing as, a, as, a, as an organisation. Uh, we're doing that in two phases, so we're looking at what we do internally as an organisation, but we're also looking at the organisations that we fund and what they do in respect of equalities, diversity, and inclusion. We want everyone to think hard about how they can reach out beyond the what some would say the same old people that, 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 that always access um, the arts and, and, and art, arts and creative activities. The work that we do in some of our ring fence programs so for example youth music um, and through our youth arts hubs and through cashback for creativity I think is exemplary in terms of its reach and we've got some very robust evidence coming through reports around those programs which is beginning to signal that the arts have a significant impact in the lives of, of, of children and young people um, in a very impactful way into communities that wouldn't ordinarily have access to, to, to provision. Uh, and all of those um, reports are, uh, are available to, to read. Uh, I think... No, don't press it. Sorry. Just leave it. Uh, the, uh, Janet referenced earlier that we've been systemising the way that we collect um, the data and the stories. Um, from those that we fund and be able to present that back in, in the form of an annual report. And I think um, that will be able to tell the story over a number of years uh, about the very point that you're asking. Um, the other thing that we hold is uh, quite an in-depth survey. We refer to some of the data here in, in our submission, but um, with a company, TNS, that, that undertake that work with us and it complements the Scottish Household Survey. I think there's probably more that we can do to share um, that information and we will be looking to do that in a way that, that enables, again, this story to be uh, seen and understood and then tracked over, over time because this is a, uh, an annual process that we go through to undertake that survey and, and, and if we get better at presenting the, the stories back out, people will be able to see and understand that more effectively. Back to the point that I think Janet made earlier on about the, the number of difficult decisions that you need to make against a, a constrained um, a budget and, and um, a, a wealth of, of applications for, for support, presumably that work in terms of broadening the reach of, of the art is going to make um, increase the number of, of difficult um, decisions that have to be made in relation to people who perhaps have had quite a tradition of engaging with, with the arts and, and support through Creative Scotland or indeed through its predecessor bodies. Are you managing those expectations or can we look forward to um, further contributions to this committee uh, along the lines that, that Mary Scanlon uh, treated us to earlier on, which, which probably reflect a, a disappointment at not being able to draw down funding that previously had been available to them? Some of this work is about making the work that's already being produced more widely available, but also interpreting it and, 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 and connecting with people in a way where it's much more accessible for them. So that's not necessarily about... Um, uh, that, that's about doing things in, di in different ways um, and making sure that every seat in a theatre uh, or every, ex every exhibition gallery is, is full uh, and that ways are found to reach out and engage with people from, from all places. So I think there's still capacity within our existing portfolio of work to reach out more widely than, 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 than is currently, currently taking place. And there's some really strong evidence in respect to why that's important. So in our submission, we um, referenced a, a report that was produced uh, through the Cultural Learning Alliance in 2011. And it critically, it, 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 if, you, if you delve into that report, it, it, it talks about how participation in arts activities can increase cognitive abilities and, and how taking, structured music, taking part in structured music activities improves attainment in maths. So there's some very important reasons why we need to encourage our arts organisations to connect out. Um, we, that report also talks about the fact that students from low-income families are three times more likely to get a degree. That's very compelling raison d'etre for, 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 for reaching out to, to, to more widely to communities. Uh, and actually, interestingly, in the, in the middle of that report, it says that children and young people who are involved in arts and cultural activities are 20% more likely to vote. Um, so another reason uh, in terms of contribution. <laughs> well, <laughs> doesn't know. I don't think just it curious, says that. Just curious. Sorry, Ian. Yeah, can I add... Mm -hmm. Finished, yeah. Can I add one further thing, um, which is 
to understand the process of decision making that we go through, particularly on the Open Project Fund. Um, and there's one um, component part of that against which people apply and against which we, we would undertake an assessment to inform the, the decision. And as we go in, um, and open project funding runs throughout the year, as we go throughout the year, um, those uh, decision-making panels get um, statistical and data reports that enable us to really understand the map of what is both coming in and what is being supported so that we can be mindful of the extent to which public engagement um, is, a, is a component part of the, the work that we are supporting and fine-tune our decision-making to make sure that we're addressing the widest geography of Scotland, for example, um, in the, the process that we go through for open project funding. Um, apologies for interrupting Janet. Sure. Could I say one more thing? Sure. Um, just that some of, some of uh, this has to be about us asking the right questions. So just by the very fact of us asking organisations when they apply to us, what are you doing about diversity and equalities and inclusion, uh, is starting to uh, accelerate um, the thought and care that people that we've, we fund are, are putting into widening widening their reach and we saw that in our in our um, regularly funded applications we had some extraordinary compelling um, narratives and, and and propositions that were put forward to us um, in in respect of this area uh, and that was very heartwarming thank you very much um, I've got George and then Gordon and then we'll move on to the next area with Chick and Mary so George and then Gordon thank you convener good morning uh, I would like to ask um, just what Janet said there about uh, engaging with young people in the uh, arts and culture, making such a difference in areas of deprivation, uh, it can be used uh, as an example. I can, uh, as far as I'm concerned, all roads lead to Paisley, and uh, I actually had a wee look to see what Creative Scotland had done in the Renfrewshire Council area, and there was absolutely zero funding from the three-year programme from the the management, the, the fund you manage for the National Lottery. Now, that to me seems bizarre because I could tell you as the local MSP for one part of Renfrewshire, there are three or four projects that are looking for funding from that side of things. And if we're backing up the idea that my constituency there is one of the biggest areas of deprivation, then why are we not? Why are we not actually going down this route and trying? Is it the fact that there is nobody making applications? Or is it because uh, well, they've made applications and they haven't actually been successful? Because I find it strange that we don't actually uh, have that in that area, considering the cultural impact that the great town of Paisley's had in the world. Yeah, and that's and not just me. <laughs> and and me, I, me t I, I, I too have a concern about that. So this morning at about 6am, I was busy scrutinising the areas that we don't funds um, and it isn't it's it's East Renfrewshire as you say it's Renfrewshire it's, it's South Lanarkshire uh, and Clackmannockshire so all of those areas are areas where we, we, we and, and Ayrshire I think we have some work through um, uh, yeah. some of our ring fence programs uh, play into Ayrshire uh, but not in relation to regular funding for sure um, so we fund um, 21 out of the, the 32 local authorities have got regularly funded organisations uh, and clearly we need to focus on looking at how we can better um, extend out to, to more local authorities in the future. We have a place team, so we have a director of strategy uh, whose remit is to look at how we can De develop relationships with local authorities across Scotland and work effectively to ensure that we can make sure that across Scotland there is good good um, delivery um, in, 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 into every place. Um, we know where the gaps are uh, and that's not good enough and we need to do something about that. Because you've already stated the difference it can make uh, to, we're talking about educational attainment regularly in this committee and uh, the culture has um, serious impact in that as well but one of the things I was I was quite shocked with so much that we don't seem to have any applications coming from Renfrewshire and Paisley in particular is uh, Paisley's bidding for the 2021 City of Culture uh, I find that bizarre that there's been no uh, kind of work going backwards and forwards with local authorities and others to actually get towards that bid and actually to make sure that we're in a position when it's announced in 2007 that surely there'd be some form of strategy and working together at this stage. There is, and we are talking to Paisley about UK City of Culture and looking at how we can um, align our, our support uh, into that bid. We're just um, giving them no funding. 
I think I think you'll find that that will change um, once we coordinated an approach uh, to strengthen the applications coming through. We've just had news that the uh, Paisley have appointed um, their. Um, I don't know whether it's secret or not. They've just appointed their uh, lead for the delivery of the bid. Um, it, it's it's um, someone who we have a very strong relationship with um, and who will be, I think, incredibly dynamic in terms of, of shaping. Uh, and I know that Please. we will work very closely um, with Paisley in respect of delivering that bid, as indeed we will with any other um, uh, propositions that come forward from other places in Scotland. For Tell you the truth, I'm not bothered about the rest. It's just crazy. <laughs> it's, uh, Dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, uh, George is, is interested in all areas of Scotland in this committee. Um, <laughs> um, maybe just in that vein, actually, if, uh, not to focus on Paisley specifically, but um, a couple of points, really general points. I think it's worth, worth recognising that, that work does travel. Um, and the audiences within Paisley and, and Renfrewshire and, and Ayrshire and Clackmannshire and so on do benefit from those that we already support. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't want to be able to support those directly. No, 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 no. Um, um, no, but the, 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 the second point um, is one where we recognise that we um, often need to have very targeted conversations in certain areas in order to build capacity and confidence and generate and stimulate ideas and, and be able to um, have those discussions that will lead to uh, better quality applications that stand a greater chance of success or indeed um, stimulate some, some new and fresh ideas. Um, and the place-based uh, working that, that Janet referred to uh, has other parts of the country is as good examples of that in Dumfries and Galloway, for example, in Aberdeenshire, for example, where um, quite targeted uh, conversations through place partnership working can really stimulate and, and, and improve the, uh, the overall um, uh, level of support that's available in certain parts of the country. And I think it's also important to say that, that institutions are important but so are individuals, and Scotland has an incredibly rich mix of individuals who are doing all sorts of different kinds of creative things, um, often in very, very small ways, but very impactful ways. And it's important that we support the individuals that come to us to be able to move and work in many different places across Scotland, as well as the place where they're, they're, they're based. And as Ian says, touring uh, and, 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 and it is, is important within that. Uh, our art strategy will focus both on supporting institutions, but also, uh, I think probably quite prominently, really thinking hard about what our responsibility is in respect of individuals and, 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 and micro-enterprises um, who make a tangible difference to communities, uh, often can make a bigger difference to communities um, through, through their effort than, than, than large institutions. Thank you very much. Uh, Gordon. Convener. And as an Edinburgh MSP, I'm more than happy with the level of funding that comes from Creative Scotland. However, I am aware <laughs> I am aware about a fifth of the population of Scotland doesn't get any funding on the regular funding uh, from the national lottery money. But what I wanted to ask you about was this £100 million fund that you spend over three years. Um, the average allocation is £33 million per year, but at the end of 2014-15, the £6 million of that hadn't been drawn down, and 11% of organisations who had been awarded funding hadn't received any money. Um, can you explain why that situation has arisen? Do they then get that uh, shortfall in year two and three, or is that money lost to that organisation? Uh, I'll ask Ian to explain that. So it's to do with the profiling of the way that money is distributed. Yeah, so the... the Organisations that are uh, in receipt of regular funding, uh, we have an annual process of contracting with those organisations. Mm. And what they have done at the start of their, in year one of their three year um, uh, regular funding uh, agreement is to profile how they would uh, plan to expend over the course of three years, subject to, the, to resources in, in years two and three being available. Um, and so that's, that's partly the answer that lies behind that. And the other is one of a, a matter of timing of being able to agree the funding agreements with the organisation. So uh, the direct answer to the question is no, the money is not lost. Um, it's, uh, it's just a matter of timing and profiling. Right, but if it's a three-year package of £100 million, I mean, you know, 
is, are we in a situation, I understand the point about profiling, but will that money be, a, will the lottery allow that money to be carried forward from year to year? So the way uh, the budgets work is that grant and aid from the Scottish Government is an annu has an annual um, mm. uh, income and expenditure profile that, that has to be pretty exact. Mm -hmm. um, National Lottery, uh, we seek to uh, employ the same rules around that, the same mm. uh, basis, but the actual nature of it enables us to flex over years, and that's why you will see um, our ability, it's, it's mainly capital that has the biggest effect on this, the ability to um, be able to play the budgets through um, over a number of years in the way that we can both cash profile as well as budget. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, check. Thank you. <coughs> Just to, following on the question of, of funding, I'd like to talk about uh, governance and, and also the tangible benefits that may come from funding. Uh, but before I do, I have to say that Paisley is on the route from Ayr to Glasgow. I'd like to talk about Ayr. Now, seriously, in terms of looking at Ayrshire, where we had no uh, non-regular funding, um, there are, there's certainly the frustration in terms of getting funding. I don't know what the criteria is, but I'd like to send you a link that two young filmmakers have uh, made a film about the Second World War. Uh, uh, aircrafts and, and interesting film, very short, but couldn't get any funding. And I couldn't get any funding for them either. Um, just on the funding, can you tell me what your revenue spend, what your revenue expenditure budget was last year and what you actually spent in terms of your direct spend? Not um, national, na not yet. Operational yeah, overhead or in, grants? In terms of revenue expenditure, budget for, for, for grants and, and, and loans, and what did you actually spend? So we uh, are undertaking our annual accounts uh, at the moment. It's going to our board for sign-off um, next week, and we'll be publishing that November, December time. That includes all those figures. I'm sorry I don't have them to hand, but I'm happy that we can share that with the committee. If we could, because I think, that, again, that was one of the, the concerns that we had in terms of not spending up to the budget before. Can I come back to governance, which again was another issue at the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, uh, when there was some a question raised about who calls the shots and where does the buck stop, etc. In the paper submitted to us, we had a, a comment from Common Guild. They made an interesting point that uh, Greater Scotland's ability to manage the difficult funding process has been undermined, undermined by the Scottish Government's decision to fund Scottish Youth Theatre despite the company's failure to secure funding. Do you believe you've got control of all spending related to uh, uh, culture in Scotland? Well, the honest answer to that is we don't have control of all Why spending. Don't because we don't uh, have control over the spending uh, in respect of the national companies um, and national galleries uh, at, as those are funded directly by, by government. Yeah, but um, you should, surely you have responsibility for the Scottish Youth Theatre. We decided not to fund the Scottish Youth Theatre as part of our decisions around regular funding on the basis that we had to make judgments and decisions uh, set against a finite budget. Uh, Scottish Youth Theatre assessed very strongly, like a number of other organisations, that we also decided not to fund through that route. Um, and we, we uh, are now working with Scottish Youth Theatre um, through the different routes of funding that they've been able to generate uh, to support them to transition and strengthen their opportunity next it, time round. Frankly, that's an unacceptable answer because you know and I know we had this big discussion about where the buck stopped and we, it was agreed that Creative Scotland would do it. Now, and you have responsibility, you're saying you're working with Scottish Youth Theatre who got funding elsewhere and the, the elsewhere was the Scottish Government. Now, either you're in control of all the funding and, and, and the strategy that goes with it, or you're not. And, and it's disappointing, to, you know, I'm not saying it's your fault, but disappointing to find that here we have a, a sum of money allocated to an organisation for which you have strategic involvement with in terms of their, their strategy and your strategy, and yet there's a sum of money that's been given to them uh, by giving you a body swerve. What was your reaction to that? I think the 
the, the way we reflected on that, the way I reflected on that, is additional money was found for the arts. Uh, and as the organisation uh, which has the responsibility for generating opportunity for the arts, any additional money is, 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 is welcome. Um, and so we, we were comfortable at that stage on that decision on the basis that Scottish Youth Theatre scored well in their assessment. They, they scored exceedingly well in some of the areas of their application. Um, and they were a, one of a, a number of organisations that were on the cusp uh, of, 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 of getting funding, where they, they just fell below the line where we had to draw um, a close on, on, on the budget. Uh, and, and, and therefore, we were not able to, to fund them right. uh, it, at that point. Which means you're not in control of your strategy. If, you, if, some, if somebody else can fund part of your strategy, then you're not in control of it. However, I, let me just ask something else. We, currently, in, in the, the Economy Committee, we're looking at, uh, or have been looking at the internationalisation of, of uh, Scottish business, of which, you know, uh, culture, crafts, etc., is very, very important. When did you last meet the digital games industry, and what discussions did you have with them regarding international, internationalisation of, of their sales? We um, worked with Scottish Enterprise um, around the digital uh, media industry leadership group. I, I hope I've got that right. Um, and uh, where, through Clive Gilman, our Director of Creative Industries, um, we're going to be carrying out reviews recommended by the um, uh, EAT Committee um, of, of the games industry, uh, its impact, and um, out of that will we'll come a more focused, hope, shared approach in terms of how we can well, better... When did you meet them last? Uh, I would have to go back and check the exact date of when the last uh, meeting took would place. Do you agree that a critical part of the overall... Uh, I do, and <laughs> uh, certainly uh, uh, feedback... Um, from people outside of Scotland, and, and I was talking to someone involved in the creative industries in Paris, uh, perception in terms of Scotland's brand is that craft and games are, are, are two pivotal areas um, of, 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 of um, quite potent brand recognition for Scotland, and we, we, we need to work very closely with the games industry in respect of how we help to uh, continue to build on the, the huge strengths that we've developed already as a nation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, could you be brief, Ian? Yeah, I'll mind. be uh, as quick as I can. I just wanted to return without uh, reopening up Scottish Youth Theatre um, uh, as such, but I wanted to just record the fact that uh, two things. One is that, of course, there were very robust conversations around that particular, um, and I, I would suggest, unique circumstance. Um, but the, the second thing is that we are in the process of co uh, discussion with the Scottish Government about uh, a refreshed framework agreement, which is the formal uh, governance structure between Scottish Government and Creative Scotland about those very governance issues um, uh, of the kind that you're re referring to. It's under discussion at our board next week and will be published online in due course, but that will set out with absolute clarity the relative and respective roles and responsibilities. Thank, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, Liam, is that a quick supplementary? Very quickly, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I declare an interest as the father of a son who benefited enormously from a residential course at SYT uh, this summer. Uh, but just following on the responses to, to, to Chick's line of questioning, I mean, it, you describe it as a unique circumstance. Other people would describe that as a precedent. And, and I think that there is a concern that um, unsuccessful applicants who go through a robust process that you've described and where uncomfortable, unpopular um, decisions have to be made um, can then go off and, 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 and seek solace from, from Scottish Government, that you're inviting a process that in a sense has now an alternative route to it. And, and, I, and I, I can't see how that can be avoided in, in, in subsequent years. Uh, many organisations seek to make direct representation to the Scottish Government about funding decisions that we take. Um, I think it's very clear, the Cabinet Secretary is very clear about the extent to which she um, has no locus in, in the decision making of Creative Scotland. But she now um, has a locus because she said, well, I'll, I'll fund that directly. Uh, there was a unique circumstance there and uh, uh, <coughs> I think that the, the way that we have ensured that the framework agreement um, with Scottish Government sets out the very clear relationships um, should guard against uh, situations such as that in the future. We'll see. Uh, thank you very much. Mary. 
Yeah, yes, we have uh, a, a list of the monies that you've uh, given to organisations and allocated, but I wonder if I can ask a question. Uh, how open and transparent is your process? If an organisation applies for funding, it doesn't meet your criteria in terms of tangible benefits or connecting themes or whatever. Um, are they given the reasons for refusal? Is there feedback given? And would we be able to go into your website to see why organisations uh, haven't been given the funding they've requested? How open is it? Uh, we do talk to individual organisations in, in depth in respect of how we make decisions. I think it's important to say that sometimes organisations do meet all of our criteria and we still aren't able to fund them because of the resources that we've got available to us. Um, we will share a written assessment with an organisation um, if they're unsuccessful or if they're successful, uh, which gives them exactly how we've um, evaluated their uh, application set against their artistic um, proposition, uh, against their um, governance and management, against their financial resilience, against their audience reach. Uh, we'll talk through that uh, directly with folk when they, when they want feedback from us. We don't publish those reports online uh, because it would be ag against the, the individual interests of the organisations involved. Um, it would, it would, it, 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 I don't think that would be a, a, a popular move in terms of, 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 of um, uh, organisations who put in an application which hasn't gone through uh, and it might, they might feel that it prejudices their chances of getting uh, that application strengthened up and being successful next time round. But we're certainly very open on a one-to-one -one basis with individual applicants uh, and, and, and I think we're we're getting much better uh, and, and, and in many instances I think we're very good uh, at providing sensitive, clear, um, direct feedback um, and honest feedback. Um, and in some instances that simply means pressure on funds uh, when we had to make strategic decisions and fund something that we of a type that, uh, or in a place where we haven't funded things before, uh, not necessarily because the proposition that's coming forward isn't, um, isn't very strong. Uh, okay. And that's, that's a tough call. Okay. Uh, the level of detail that you expect in funding applications, uh, it, it, it does sound from some of the submissions we've got today is that you seem to have created a very bureaucratic process and if I could go back to the traditional music and song association they uh, suggest um, you know that organisation staff mainly by volunteers uh, often struggle to provide the level of detail that Creative Scotland is looking for and I, I can understand this and they're suggesting that applications should be segregated by the size of turnover uh, and we've also had other concerns um, in relation to delivering the four connecting themes, uh, the onerous task of reporting on these scheme, uh, themes. So do you think you could perhaps be effective, uh, efficient, have a proper audit trail, but a bit less bureaucratic and a bit more understanding of small organisations? And I go back to the 5,000... Pounds, you know, organisations that are staffed by volunteers rather than professional fundraisers. I do, and that's one of the key themes that's come through the uh, open project funding review that we've six month review that we've, we've we've just completed. Is how can we deal with the smaller, lower level of applications in a, in, a, in a more straightforward, um, easy to access, easy to implement uh, on all sides kind of a way um, and we're thinking hard about how we can address that um, and sometimes people don't only, at the moment our lowest level of funding is £1,000 sometimes people want to apply for less than that and I think we need to think hard in terms of how we can um, deliver that um, it's, it, it is a, it's a tough one because administratively dealing with small applications is, 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 is um, it requires a lot of resource um, we're looking hard at how we can partner perhaps with others to be able to deliver those smaller awards. Okay, so you're confirming that you have an audit trail for every application for funding? We do. Uh, and with that audit trail, uh, I appreciate that feedback wouldn't be available to the public, but would that audit trail and that application for funding be available to members of the public? We don't publish... We publish the applications that we've 
awarded. We don't publish the list of people who've applied for applications because uh, for some, for many, um, having it on record, public record, that they've failed in making an application uh, may not be in their interest but in terms of... But those that you've awarded, we you do. would have an audit trail yeah. of how they had managed to meet the tangible benefits criteria and the connecting themes. Yes? We publish the name, the name of the applicant that's been awarded funding, what the funding is for, and the amount of funding that an applicant gets. Uh, we don't publish a, an account of how well, how strong their application has been, uh, because that would prejudice their opportunity, not just for us, but also for other funders. Um, and applicants have fed back to us that they wouldn't want to see that detail of, of okay. um Well, in that case, could we assume, uh, I'm also on the audit committee uh, in the Parliament, so could we assume, uh, given your rigorous process, that uh, organisations that had been awarded money would have fulfilled the eligibility criteria for connecting themes and tangible benefits? Absolutely. So we have on record... Um, at Creative Scotland, an audit trail of every single application, how we've made the decision um, the various, through the various stages and pro processes of making that decision. Um, and all of that is, 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 is kept on our system. Okay, so just finally, can you point to specific examples uh, of projects you've funded uh, that have directly resulted in increased social or intrinsic uh, value of the arts? I'm just looking at the criteria that you're using to judge, because if there's 5,000 for traditional music, whether they filled in the application right or not, I don't know. But if that's not acceptable, you could maybe give us an idea today, which I think would be helpful to organisations looking in uh, on this discussion to see you know, what criteria you do use to judge when a project is worth awarding, but also when it has been successful. Okay. Uh, Ian chairs one of our panels in, in making decisions, so I'm going to pass over to him. Um, before I do that, uh, I suppose one of the, one of the exemplar projects that we fund, which increasing, increases um, social access to the arts, is, is, is Sistema, um, yeah. which we fund, um, which provides for, for children and young people um, from, from Govan and, and Raplock. Uh, up in Aberdeen, um, and I... Raplock isn't in Aberdeen, it's in Stirling. No, no, I meant Raplock in Stirling, and then also separately in, in Aberdeen. In Aberdeen. Um, and I've um, met some of the young people who've benefited from um, from the Raplock project I visited a few months ago. Um, I was incredibly impressed by what that work had offered them, uh, not necessarily because they're all going to go on and, and become artists, uh, but just simply in terms of their um, ability to be able to articulate uh, ambition, um, their ability to be able to develop their interpersonal skills, their confidence. Um, it, it, it really is making a genuine difference, I think, to, to the lives of, of, of those children and young people, some of whom come from, from very disadvantaged backgrounds indeed. So if we were to ask for the audit trail, uh, for example, for tea in the park, you would be able to supply that? We could, yes. You and could. We have funded, I think, I think I'm right in saying, um, and Ian will correct me if I'm wrong, we've, we've, we've provided funding for activity taking place at Tea in the Park once, and that was uh, specifically to fund the Arches, which is the organisation in Glasgow, which unfortunately fortunately doesn't exist now. Uh, it was to assist the Arches to deliver a programme of arts work in that context in order to increase its marketability in terms of its, its That's commercial That's for this prospects. year's Tea in the Park? No. Uh, that was in previous years. We, yeah. we have not provided funding for tea in the park this year. Um, just to just to finish, um, one of the, one of the reasons why we've asked um, a number of organisations to come along, including yourself, is to allow us to try and assess the tangible out uh, tangible outcomes from uh, the organisation, uh, in particular what we effectively get for our money, I suppose, if you want to put it in that crude fashion. One of the issues today has been that you, and maybe this is our fault, maybe it's a timing issue, but you have mentioned repeatedly that you will publish, you'll shortly report, 
in the near future. I, mean, I could go on. You're going to carry out. It will have a significant impact. We will, we will be in a position to... A lot of it is talking about something that is not yet happening. Um, it will happen in the future. You'll send us it when it occurs, etc., etc. I'm just wondering, uh, is that our fault for, for asking you wrong at, along at the wrong time of year? Um, but even if we have done that, would it not have been possible to actually look back at the previous year and, and, and answer many of the questions with evidence-based answers about what has happened and you have got information for and you have published already, uh, rather than some of the answers which have been very much looking to, well, we can't answer it because we're, 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 we haven't yet published? And uh, it's possible that I may have confused the issue here. We have just published our figures for 13, 14. Uh, so those are now online um, and you can access them. Um, the figures that I'm referring to this year are the first set of figures against our current ten year, uh, our current um, corporate plan. So, so um, we have published figures for last year. They are available um, online uh, to access. You get, I'm, making a, I'm making a general point, I suppose, about um, many of the answers today were, were about announcements yet to come. Um, are, are, would you suggest to us, I'm asking for genuinely advice, that um, if you publish everything in the autumn, are we better to come and ask, <coughs> ask you to come and see us in the January? We'd be very happy to do that uh, and, and, and come back once we've published. No, but in, in, no, if we did this on an annual basis, is, this, is September the wrong time of year to ask you here? Uh, potentially, because, um, just to be absolutely clear, uh, the 10 year plan started year one in 1415. The evidence on the deliverables and tangible outcomes from that work is what we will produce, uh, our, 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 our collating at the moment and we'll be producing um, November, December time. So, yes, uh, January is, is a better time where and, the and actual... And that would be on an annual basis? That's, that's when you would produce that material? Yes, that, that would be the that's, cycle. That's effective. So the annual, they're six months apart. The annual plan within each of the t year of the 10-year plan is produced in April, and then six months later, um, the uh, annual report on the previous year uh, is published. Yeah, thank you for that. So, Chick, did you want to? Yeah, yes, uh, just, just for clarity, and I may have misunderstood, but when I asked my question about the numbers, uh, I think Ian said that these were going to the board for approval, but they were draft, and yet Janet has just said that last year's numbers are already up on your website. Well, what is the situation? Two different things. Uh, what Janet's referring to are the data uh, that we hold in relation to the audiences and number of performances oh. and so on and so forth. Um, the and other, the financial numbers, the financial numbers um, around the annual accounts for both grant and aid and national lottery are what's going to the board for sign off next week. They've been to our audit committee um, and they will be laid before both parliaments um, in November, December time. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my questions are probably in and around uh, collaborative working and uh, some of your key partner relationships are with uh, Skills Development Scotland and Scottish Enterprise and uh, the Cabinet Secretary Puhona Hislop uh, at a meeting on the 3rd of September uh, made clear to Scottish Enterprise and to yourselves that a memorandum of understanding must be put in place. Uh, could you maybe advise the committee how this work is progressing and what from your perspective are the key parts of the agreement and what do you hope to achieve from the, uh, the memorandum of understanding? Yes, we, we have a, a memorandum of understanding which is in progress. I spoke to Lena Wilson last Friday and had a number of conversations with other members of her team about the content of the memorandum of understanding. Uh, it will identify what our shared interests are, um, what our respective roles are, um, and how we'll work together in respect of creative industries development uh, in, in, in future. Um, we, we're in the process of, 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 as I've said, developing our creative industries strategy. Clive Gilman um, began his post in June. He's already produced the strategy. We took it to SKIP, which is Scottish Creative Industries Partnership, which pulls together all of our partners around the creative industries at the end of August. And I, we've had a lot of interest from SKIP partners in 
respect of working with us on ensuring that the text, the, the content of, of that strategy works as a, um, a shared vision for how we might work together. So since the end of August, we've been having some quite detailed discussion with each of those partners, very, very positive discussion, um, but it's taken a bit of time to work through. And it wouldn't be appropriate to sign off our memorandum of understanding with Scottish Enterprise until that work has fully taken place. Um, so I've, I had a report uh, at the end of last week, uh, which was very positive. Um, Clive has met on a, individually with representatives from Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll now share all of that with our colleagues at Scottish Government. Uh, once we've got to that stage, we'll then play that strategy out for public consultation uh, in the same way that we did for the screen strategy. Uh, we'll want to get public feedback into it. Um, I presented the headlines of that at a Creative Industry Symposium last, uh, last week, um, last Tuesday, I think it was, um, and uh, broadly it generated, I think, um, positive response uh, in respect of, of, of what it contained. Um, but we just want to make sure, um, and I think it's interesting because we, we've really gone into this in the spirit of public sector reform, in, in the spirit of making best use of our shared public resource with our partners in, 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 in the best possible way. Uh, the appetite for that amongst the, the, the team across our skip partners has, has been tremendous. Um, but obviously, the more people who are involved in producing a strategy, the longer longer that it takes. Uh, we're very, very close now to, to getting that position. Um, and at that point, we'll be able to, to pin down that memorandum of understanding with Scottish Enterprise um, in, a, in a proper way. When you say you, you're close, Janet, I mean, how close are we? I mean, it's like, I mean, your answer to some of the questions has been about, you know, sometime in the future, you know, and yeah. I know you have a 10-year plan, but obviously there are things, you know, need to happen, need to happen yeah. kind of quick. Well, we've published and I'm quite the screen sure a memorandum strategy. Memorandum of understanding is one of the priorities. So, I mean, if the difficulty is not with yourself uh, in, in relation to coming up with that, where does the problems lie? So, uh, probably from my point of view, the question would be: I mean, how soon is soon? I mean, and, and, and you know, when is it to happen? I, I, Lena and I had a good, constructive conversation. Um, and tackle some of the outstanding issues last Friday. We need right. to now share that with 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 our, our more widely in our teams, and and, and 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 I need to share that with my chair, Richard Finley. Uh, I'm confident that we will get to a good, solid place in respect of that um, MOU. It, for me, it has to it has to um, we have to take account of the overall ecosystem of public bodies working together, um, and we've needed to run run through the time that it's taken to get people fully um, across and comfortable with the direction that we're proposing uh, and give people a chance, chance to chip in um, and, 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 and for it to make sense for them. And uh, I, I think it's really exciting that we've got to a place uh, where in Scotland we're able to have good, honest, clear dialogue across public bodies um, and, 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 and harness our efforts together. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I, mean, I was comfortable with the creative industry strategy probably uh, a good two or three weeks ago. Uh, I want to give everyone a chance to be able to, to feed in and, and, and make sure it makes sense to them. Because ultimately, driving the creative industries forward um, or, or supporting the sector, supporting industry to drive itself forward has to be something that we all collectively do together. And if we're going to do that, um, then everybody needs to have a chance to, to go through that strategy uh, with a tooth comb and, and um, yeah. make sense of it for themselves. Um, so uh, are you unable to put a definite time on it then? Would it be within the next three months, six months? On the strategy? Months? Um, on the, no, on your, the, you know, your, no, your, your memorandum of understanding. As I say, it's, it's, it's almost there. I don't, personally, I don't think it should be uh, published before we've, we've got to a point where we've got collective agreement on the strategy. Uh, and so I think in terms of order of things, we should have that shared agreement around the strategy, play it out to consultation, and at that point we should be then defining how we work with our public sector partners um, around, around that, that, that agreed purpose. Um, I think 
it's important to get the order of things right in respect of how we, we approach that. But there's certainly no resistance on our part in terms of, 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 of holding an MOU, not just with Scottish Enterprise, but with other, with other public bodies too. We have MOUs with a number of different organisations. Uh, it's a good way of, of, of signalling shared intent uh, around this area of work. John? Aids, AIDS have said that they have a good working relationship with, with yourselves. Uh, however, they have suggested uh, further work could be done to develop links with the educa education sector. Could the use art strategy Time to Shine uh, be adapted to take account of AIDS' views? And how receptive is the education sector to further promoting the art in schools? Yes, I mean, I suppose um, I should start by saying the Curriculum for Excellence, which contains the expressive arts as a core part of uh, its, its, its function is, is a fantastic thing and it's very important to us that we work very closely with the education sector to support the delivery of it. Um, the way to do that is to ensure that Scotland has access to the right skills through its teaching resource to be able to, to effect that um, as fully as, as, as possible. Um, and again, through the work that we do with children and young people, um, through the um, MOU that we, um, we do have with Education Scotland, um, we are working to foster an environment where, 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 where better, um, more assertive work in schools can, can, can take place and those skills gaps can be addressed. <coughs> sorry, I'll check one quick supplementary. Yeah, sorry. just to, to the previous one, and, and forgive me if, if this is fairly robust, but you know when John quoted Fiona Hislop uh, making clear that there had to be a memorandum of understanding, she did so on the 3rd of September. Of course, uh, we meet on a Wednesday, and the 3rd of September wasn't this month, it was last year. Why has it taken a year to get a memorandum of understanding? I, uh, I'd like some clarification in terms of whether our first point of um, discussing an MOU... We only meet on a Wednesday. There is no Wednesday, 3rd of September this year, and I remember it, it was Wednesday, 3rd of September last year. Pardon? Yeah, in the EET. So in the EET committee, when she, she attended and, and when we were doing the inquiry, in Wednesday, 3rd of September 2014, why has it taken a year to get a memorandum of understanding? I'd like some clarification of whether that's a, an accurate date, but I think the principle... Well, I've just checked it. Okay. The principle of an MOU with Scottish Enterprise and indeed our other partners around uh, in, in respect to the creative industries is something that we absolutely subscribe to. It, it, it's important to have something to gather our energies around. But and why does it take a year? To produce a strategy. Well to produce a memorandum of understanding of who has what roles and responsibilities. It's a question we asked then, it's a question uh, I asked today in terms of uh, body swells around you, know, you making decisions. I asked the question again, why does it take a year to create a memorandum of understanding on roles and responsibilities? I, I'll, I'll just say again that for us, having a clear sense of direction to gather our shared intent around is important. We, produce, we appointed a director of creative industries to do that work um, after two rounds of, of, of recruitment. I have to say we set the bar high, so we didn't want to, we didn't want to appoint straight off. Uh, so it took us a bit of time uh, after our previous director left uh, to appoint somebody. Clive Gilman was appointed in June this year. Uh, he produced the strategy within a month of being in post. We've now shared that with our other public sector bodies uh, and are working on getting that to a, a, a point where we're, we're all comfortable that it, 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 it represents an appropriate way forward. Uh, a memorandum of understanding with all of those partners needs to follow on from that, from yeah. Creative Scotland's perspective. But as you rightly pointed out, that decision at the end of the day will be made by the chief executives of the, respond the, the, the bodies involved. And in fact, before you develop your strategy, you, you need to have some idea of what the roles and responsibilities are going to be. What I, we, and I'm afraid the question still stands, uh, and you know, I, I don't want to you know, uh, push it any further, but it does seem, uh, based on my experience, uh, inimical to, to 
wait for a year to produce a memorandum of understanding as to how organisations are going to work together. What, anyway, we, yeah. what we do have is a published, a published terms of reference for SCIP, uh, which is available on our website. That gives you a clear sense of how all of the SCIP partners, um, as a, a group of public bodies, meet on a quarterly basis and our uh, joint commitment in respect of how we work together. Um, that document is live, it is available, it is, it is accessible uh, and does exist. Uh, what we're talking about in terms of next steps is the detail of how we, we work um, in respect to the creative industry strategy, which hasn't been finalised yet in terms of individual uh, relationships across that group. Okay, thank you. Okay, just, just to try and be helpful, I mean, I think it would be helpful to the committee if you were able to write to us afterwards and explain... Um, in some detail, the process has been undertaken since the point at which the um, statement was made that there should be a memorandum of understanding put in place to the point we're at today. I think that would be helpful if you wrote to us and explained that, what's, what's been happening during that period, so that we're clear about the process and, and what's actually been achieved uh, during this period. Okay? Uh, well, very briefly, Mary. Yes, I, I just wonder if a memorandum of understanding is needed in the first place. I mean, to well, to sure look at the respective sure. roles and ask them to talk to each other. So I think we need to know well, why does government have to step in to get two organisations to talk to each other? I'm sure so you'll ask the cabinet. Can that be I'm sure you'll ask the cabinet secretary. I'm sure that uh, Creative Scotland can mention in their letter why they think it's a. Uh, uh, necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would reassure the committee that we do talk to each other uh, and indeed have been criticising for talking to each other too much <laughs> in the past. Well, uh, but that you're is damned ongoing. if you do and you're damned if you don't, Janet, I'm afraid, sorry. But, <laughs> ongoing um, dialogue. Um, uh, John, I know, I know John's got one final question. Just one. No question. Uh, how does Creative uh, Scotland ensure that funding programmes connect with the various strategies uh, issued by other organisations such as SDS skills investment plans? And could further work be done to ensure greater cohesion across the two public bodies? Okay, so that's that's where um, I suppose um, the, the slowing down of our strategy has been for that very reason, in that we're now going through very detailed uh, read across in respect of individual strategies that have been produced by other public bodies in respect of their focus on the creative industries, which for most of them, uh, I think it's important to say, is only a small proportion of the overall work that they do. For us, arts and creative industries is everything. For other public bodies, it's a part of a much wider suite of, 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 of interests. Um, but nevertheless, we've been meeting uh, and going through um, line by line how what we're producing weaves across into the strategies that others have produced and are in process of producing uh, to make sure that we've got a, a, a joined up approach uh, so that we can all make best proper use of public resources in the most effective way that we can um, and that's that's very important to me um, it's not straightforward uh, uh, as, as, as you will all be aware uh, but it's something that I think I'm well I know I'm, 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 I'm comfortable is, is, is now taking place in a, in a good um, team Scotland collegiate um, kind of a way just one further supplementary to that on uh, page 14 of your submission uh, Creative Scotland has funded organisations which have supported 265 work placements, 76 apprenticeships uh, and traineeships and 108 internships. Can you perhaps advise, if you can't you tell us, you may be right to the committee, could you tell us what was the duration and nature of these apprenticeships and whether the apprentices remained employed afterwards and what are they doing to expand, what are you doing to expand modern apprenticeships within the in the creative sector. Yes, we'll write to you with that in, in, in information. But I can tell you that uh, one of the um, interns, uh, apprenticeships that we had in our own organisation, uh, set up a company that we continue to use um, from time to time uh, in respect of documenting um, uh, conferences and, 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 and such like. Um, but we will write to you with a detailed response to that question. That would be Thank, Thank you. you. Can, I, can I just finish off this morning's session? With one question, obviously we're taking, the, this, and the, one of the reasons, of course, that we asked you along at this time of the year is because it's in advance of the Scottish Government's publication of its draft budget, um, which is obviously, I'm sure, all waiting on um, with a great deal of interest. I'm just wondering, though, if you find your budget has been increased, what added value would you deliver with that increase? Uh, and also, and equally, if your funding, funding is squeezed in that draft budget, what would be the tangible impact 
of such a move. Okay. Um, in, uh, Ian will um, uh, want to add to what I say. Uh, in terms of added value, we know that when we received applications for regular funding, we received £140 million pounds worth of fundable applications that had we had the resource, we would have funded. In, 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 in the event, we had to cap um, our, 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 our limits at £100 million over three years. Um, so that would give you an indication of where some of that extra resource may go. Um, in in, 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 in um, I, I, there's also the, the, the softer end of the work that we do in respect of development where we're unlocking opportunity for other resources to come in alongside ours through working in partnership with others in Scotland and beyond. Uh, increasing our capacity to be able to do that is important. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, I would say that our, what we would dearly love to be able to do is to have a better focus for individuals, uh, for those people uh, who make a difference in communities, in places that, that sometimes organisations don't reach. Um, there are many examples globally of, 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 of governments who are able to fund individuals in different ways to us uh, to be able to stretch out um, more generously uh, in, in, in terms of working with people in communities across Scotland. So those are some of the things that I would say in terms of uh, where additional resource might go um, and then of course on the screen and creative industries side um, we've managed to increase our, our screen funding through working with the Scottish Government um, to generate more production resource um, there's clearly opportunity to think about that uh, more ambitiously if one wanted to to compete with other nations on the creative industry side interestingly some of the feedback that we've had from the industry workshops where we've been meeting with folk uh, is not so much about funding it's about in access to uh, venture capital or business angels um, or investment uh, or, or small loans uh, that would make the, the difference in respect of that space uh, and and we're looking at how we might be able to partner with others to be able to, to, to make that happen. Um, in terms of a decrease in funding, that's a very difficult question. Um, we would have to make difficult decisions in respect of where our priorities lie. Um, and I think we would want to come back to you with analysis around where the impact of that would sit. Uh, if, if that were to be the case, uh, clearly all of the things that we've talked about this morning have given a sense of the pressure and, 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 and stretch that we feel as a funder that it operates across a hugely creative notion uh, and, 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 and where um, I think comparatively with other nations, we have a significantly larger number of both organisations and individuals operating per population as a whole uh, and where... In fact, in truth, I think it came through from um, one of the um, submissions that you had, uh, the level of funding that we're able to offer, even those who are funded now, comparatively with organisations in other countries, including England, is a little bit less. Um, and therefore, the stretch uh, and the risk factor that plays into those organisations being able to be stable and sturdy and sure-footed is quite high. Um, so, so we are challenged in respect of the way that we fund. Um, and I think we would, we would, we would have to think hard uh, and in the context of, of, of any redu reductions in funding, uh, would have to have some very honest conversations with, with uh, uh, both the committee and with, with Scottish Government colleagues um, and accept that um, there would be some, some, some pain and some difficult decisions in some quarters. Uh, we're in, as you would expect us to be, we're, 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 we're thinking about that uh, and we will be able to report back to you on that, on that front um, in due course. Yeah, I mean, uh, Scotland's culture is absolutely recognised um, globally and the art screen and creative industries have a, a, a major role that plays into that. I think we've written in our submission, I think it's 0.02% of our, uh, our budget represents 0.02% of the Scottish Government overall budget. Um, and it would seem to me that that offers and delivers huge value um, uh, for what is around um, the, the margins of the overall Scottish Government budget and actually exponentially therefore it has a huge kind of leverage and um, effect in the way that it uh, it affects intrinsic social and, and economic value um, and for a wee bit more could deliver that multiplier effect in, in even more powerful ways. I think if there were to be a reduction as Janet says we would 
we're looking at that very carefully to, to understand what the implications of that might be. But um, again, because it's around the margins, it wouldn't save very much in terms of Scottish Government overall budgets. Um, but actually, the, because of that multiplier effect, it actually could be quite damaging for the longer term. And some parts of that very fragile infrastructure that do exist on, um, on very low levels of public funding in, in some instances um, could be fundamentally damaged and ir ir irrecoverably so and, and therefore have a longer term impact on um, Scotland's uh, global reputation in terms of art screen and creative industries. So I think there's um, uh, uh, small amounts of money either way um, can have exponentially beneficial or detrimental effects potentially. Okay, thank you very much. Can I thank you both for uh, being here this morning? I, I know you had another meeting, Janet. That, that maybe you, maybe you'd prefer to have been at that meeting. I'm not sure, but uh, thank you very much for coming along this morning. We do appreciate you taking the time to come to the committee. Uh, we have agreed, however, to take items uh, six and seven in private. Therefore, I now close the meeting to the public.